Well, uh, this is going to be the first panel. And I'm delighted that we have uh, colleagues who have been working with over many years on this project. And in particular, I'm going to set a little conceptual framework because I think one of the first things is to say when we talk about words like fraud or corruption or integrity, are we talking about the same thing? And then we'll move on to a paper which Andy Reynolds is going to be presenting. And Andy and Jorgen were the two colleagues who really, in some ways, kicked off a large part of our work by establishing the idea that we needed better measures of how experts saw elections. So they're going to present the rationale for that project and why we set up that data. And then two of the colleagues which I mentioned earlier from the Electoral Integrity Project, um, Ferran Martinez Icoma and Rich Frank, are going to talk about the new study and the new data that we've started off, which is the Perception of Electoral Integrity Index. And it's a survey of experts, and we're talking about the methods and so on that we're using there. So let me start off by just talking about a little bit about the concepts, and in particular, how we can think about the concepts that we're going to be using throughout this area. Um, and it's the first paper in your packet. If you have your packet with you, I'm sorry it's so big and fat. I do apologize. You can take home the electronic version so your plane doesn't crash, as it were. Um, <laughs> But this is basically uh, setting out some of the aspects of the overall concepts that I think we need to really revise and radically think through. So these are the questions which we mentioned. When do elections fail? What happens? And what can be done to mitigate these problems? So first, I want to really hammer out a little bit about the words and the rhetoric and the language and the concepts that we use. It's often the most difficult things to change. So a lot of the papers, for example, are talking about fraud as though we all know what that is and as though that's the core. Others are talking about malpractices, for example. In particular, Sarah's own work has very much focused on the idea of malpractices. And the project, as we set it up, focuses on integrity. So are these all the same thing? How do we think about these words? What I'd like to argue is that there is a core concept and that it has certain features. And I'd like to present those to you to see whether or not you can be on the same idea. And then I'll mention that there are various subfields, so often again, People who are working in public administration are not necessarily talking to those who work on political behavior. Those who work on political behavior and surveys aren't necessarily talking to those in security studies. But I think we need to meld these areas together to really understand the dimensions and the challenges of electoral integrity. And then I'll briefly talk about the actual project, but really leave that to my colleagues who are going to talk in more detail. My pictures, by the way, I always like to refer to are from Hogarth, and the reason not only that I love Hogarth, is also that it really reminds us that the problems that we're talking about aren't simply contemporary problems. Historically, they go right back to corruption, rotten boroughs, and everything else in 18th century and 19th century uh, Britain and America, Tammany Hall and so on. There's nothing new about electoral corruption. It's an old issue. So these are some of the words which you'll find in the papers and in the discussion. So people, when they talk about it, are really referring to something about the normative evaluation of the quality of elections. But you can have very minimalist notions. For example, you can think that an election fails if multi-party competition is so restricted that one party, the winner, always gets in. This, of course, is Travorsky's notion of the distinction between democracy and autocracy. It's been with us for many, many years. But we know that there are many elections which uh, uh, allow competition but are flawed fundamentally in multiple ways. So it's too narrow to simply take this rather sharp black and white distinction as our definition of an election that has integrity or an election which fails. The more common parlance, very common amongst diplomats, is the very woolly language, free and fair. And of course, it has historical roots. But as Jorgen has, has written about this in particular in a very good article, the word, these words themselves really need a tremendous amount of interpretation and they're not clear. And so it's too woolly to create any barriers, to create any boundaries, to actually let us know what's going on. Genuine elections is even woollier. And again, it goes right back to the Human Rights Declaration when these words were being used, a genuine contest, a genuine choice. But what is a genuine choice? One of our colleagues, Larry Leduc, has been writing a paper about that um, as a fellow. But again, it's not clear. We could talk about integrity in a very narrow version as not corrupt. And that has a certain honesty. That means a kind of transparency. But again, I think that's a little bit too narrow because there are many elections in which, for example, money doesn't change hands or there's no bribery of officials or voters aren't bought, but still there are fundamental problems, for example, in media bias or in violence 
or in lots of other flaws in a particular election. Legitimate, mm, that's another one you could say, but whose idea of legitimacy? Uh, if the public thinks the election is good, is that the criteria that would use? That's a very slippery slope. And there are other words, obviously, like manipulated, fraudulent, and failed. Well, let's say that if we actually look at the literature, there are at least these four standards, and I think that the first three in some ways are problematic. So the first one, which is liked by lawyers, uh, Chad Vickery and colleagues have very much emphasized this version of fraud. What is a fraudulent act? It's one which is illegal. It breaks the law, quite simply. You offer a bribe to a voter, that's against the law. You try and uh, create uh, problems on the independence of the Electoral Commission, that breaks the law. But the problem is, of course, that in many, many of the worst countries and some of the others, there are laws which in many ways are flawed, are, are really problematic. And the classic example for me is Singapore. The election is working effectively, it's efficient, but of course one party comes back time and time again, largely because of gerrymandering at an early stage, which means the opposition really has no chances. So the notion of an electoral law can be very useful in a particular country, but the problem is that the laws themselves differ from one place to another. So it's not a comparative standard. You can't use that as a benchmark. Maladministration is another phrase which is being used, particularly by those who focus on electoral management bodies. So if they don't deliver the papers, the pallet papers at right time, if they run out of ink, if they don't have the training, if they don't have the computers, that's a clear example of failure, of performance. And that's quite common. It's about a failure of governance. But again, that's not all of the problems that we want to talk about in this room. The biggest challenge, I think, to the concept I, which I would put forward is the one which says, well, what we can do is we can talk about democratic values. This is very common, I think, particularly amongst American political scientists, but also amongst others. And the argument here is that we can take certain democratic standards from a dull, from the liberal tradition, and say if an election doesn't have these particular factors of accountability, inclusiveness, and so on, then you've got problems. But of course, in the international community, that doesn't actually help. I vividly remember in the UNDP at one stage where I was working for a couple of years, and I said to colleagues about when we were talking about definitions of democracy, well, of course, Dahl said this, and somebody said, who's Dahl? Um, which for every you know, American political scientist, oh, God, how do you not know Dahl? But for nevertheless, so as an international measure, Dahl is not the legitimate actor. So our definition, my definition is, it has to be international human rights conventions, treaties, guidelines. What does that mean? And here's the definition I, I'd like us to think about. Electoral integrity is about the world's agreement on the standards of how an election should work. So it's not my definition, it's not your definition, it's not an American definition, it's a European definition. It's something which the governments themselves have committed themselves to, and that therefore they are themselves bound by. So it's a human rights framework. And it's about the global norms, whereby the formal agreement is eventually diffused down to the public so they come to accept those norms as well. Can you have an election today, for example, without having women enfranchised? The answer is no, because nobody would accept that as a legitimate election. <coughs> there are other standards which are there as well. They apply universally. So it's, again, not about us blaming other countries for failing or about us telling other countries what to do. It's about everybody knowing that we can all go wrong quite easily. And again, think about the case of Britain, when they tried to push forward on things like postal ballots, and immediately they had all sorts of problems of fraud and other security lapses. If a country which has had the number of elections and 200 years worth of democracy of Britain can go wrong, then every country can have flaws, and we need to accept that. And it applies, again, this is an important challenge to some of our papers throughout the electoral cycle, meaning we can't just look at the end stage. We can't just look at the votes in the ballot box and how votes are counted, because that's well after everything else has happened. So we have to think right back to how, for example, the electoral management body was set up, how the independence of those officials was established, what's the electoral law. There's a whole cycle that goes through the electoral campaign, and we have to think about things like the media balance during that campaign, or the question of, of, of funding during that campaign. Then we get to the level of the actual polling day and its aftermath. And by the way, the election can be great and the aftermath can be disastrous. That has happened in a number of African cases. So, all of those things, is, as a whole, create our concept. And how many minutes do I have now? Two, okay. Um, rattling along here. So the opposite is how we want to think about it. And again, is malpractice the right word? 
I'm not sure, but it's certainly one which is the antithesis of integrity for the way that we think about this. And it can be a first order problem or a second order violation. So how do we know when an election fails? Well, we have to look at those global norms. And we have to go right back to 1948 and 1966 and continuing resolutions in the United Nations. But what's worth emphasizing is that these are only minimal standards. And all of the regional agencies, particularly those who are in the room, but many others, are pushing forward. And so we've got certain norms that everybody agrees upon. We've got certain norms which we're moving forward on and which haven't yet been agreed. And those are the areas where we need to extend the international conventions. Uh, so in particular, campaign fin finance and the media, there is no international agreement. And yet it's such a fundamental problem in so many countries that we're concerned about. So the global norms are the things that we focus on. And as I said, we can distinguish the problems in terms of two things. One is their severity. And clearly, to some extent, we're talking about the major problems like uh, ethnic violence, like problems of destabilization, like regime transitions which occur after an election. In other cases, we're talking about problems of technical capacity and a more minor set of malpractices which might exist. But the relationship between the two is also very important because sometimes in some elections, just a minor infraction, take Kenya, 1997, Jorgen was there uh, afterwards and, and looked into this, and very much it was a delay in announcing the results which triggered, amongst other factors, some of the ethnic violence which occurred. Maybe if that had been technically more efficient, some of the major serious consequences wouldn't have occurred. In addition, there are shared standards. I won't go into those, but let's say that, again, we're not just talking about contemporary problems, we're talking about historical problems as well. And we know that the countries which are now seen as long-standing democracies have had a long problem of gerrymandering, of voter buying, and all the other issues. So the problems aren't just um, contemporary problems in the worst countries. And the fourth and last feature of this definition is, as I said, the electoral cycle. And you can see it like this. So if we're going to understand electoral integrity, we cannot just stop with the stages where we're talking about the results or the votes being cast or even the voting protest. That is often what a lot of our work is looking at, particularly on fraud. But if the system is wrong from the early stages, if the electoral law is unfair, if it excludes major contestants, if the boundaries are so skewed, as I would argue they very much are in the United States, that we have tremendous gerrymandering and partisanship at that level, if voter registration has voter suppression or it has other limits, if you have problems of uh, imbalanced campaign media or excessive funding for some groups, all of those are equally, equally problematic. And if we only focus on election day, it really is, in the classic cliche, looking at the horse after the... You know, looking at the stable after the horse has bolted, looking at something after the horse has bolted, anyway, um, it's too late. The clever dictator, of course, as Sarah has argued, basically manipulates the early stages when nobody's looking and nobody's paying much attention. The stupid dictators are the ones who steal votes at the end because they haven't got anything better which they can do. So it's a new way of thinking about electoral integrity. And I'd like you just to think, does this reflect your own version of, and your own views about what integrity is? Or are there other views as well? Well, what we're going to do now is turn to the second paper, and it picks up on this idea that there are stages in the electoral cycle, and in particular it's the work uh, where we're going to look at issues of how do we start to measure which contests meet international standards. And again, Jorgen and Andy are, are the colleagues who uh, I can blame for all of this. Uh, they came along to the Cape last year, right? Uh, last August. And they said, oh, we've got this nice idea of a project. And I said, oh, I've got some money. Maybe we could get together and, and work. And then, of course, they left me to, <laughs> to, to do all the work. But no, not at all. But their vision is very much the one that I stole uh, for our project. So I'm turning over to Andy to tell us about why we need to measure all of these aspects of the cycle better. 